Uh, so we cannot hear you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dyson. So it's, you should move to or unmute to. So in the bottom left corner of the Zoom link, of the Zoom meeting, I, yeah. Okay, so it's on mute now. Thanks. Okay. So can you hear me now? Uh, can you yes. hear me now? Yes, okay. sure. Perfect. Thanks. So uh, so again, uh, thanks a lot, Rui, for the introduction. So today's talk is urban cell uh, towards talking cities. So as Rui explained, so I'm a postdoc at LBNL now working more or less on the energy system side, sustainability and climate resilience. So you'll uh, get to know more about my work uh, in this presentation. So I'll start with uh, a little uh, uh, different uh, slide. So when was the last time you spoke to a tree? So this was a confusing uh, question that was asked by my wife at that time, my girlfriend, uh, when we were having our second date. I was quite surprised because I was a PhD student by that, by that time and I've never spoke to a tree. So I asked from her, why do you speak with trees? And she said that, okay, you talk with trees to know whether they are happy or uh, sad. So that question made me to think, okay, there's a lot of uh, interaction that take place around us. I don't know how many of you here can speak trees, but although it might be surprising to some of you, uh, there is something interesting that I would like to share which is that there's a lot of communication taking place in, around us. And these communication lead uh, towards uh, more interesting interaction between the bodies that we have around us. So one uh, simple example is the interaction between trees. So although it might be surprising to some of you, trees can talk with each other. Trees interact with each other by using a mycorrhizal fungi network, which we will discuss quite uh, lengthy in this uh, presentation. And if you consider uh, the bacteria, bacteria can interact with each other through something known as quorum sensing communication. So this is the main driving factor that uh, kind of control many physiological activities of bacteria. At the same time, the quorum sensing is somewhat used by cancer cells as well. So they interact with each other during their 3D expansion or something known as the, uh, simply known as the growth of cancer cells. So what we need to understand is that there's a lot of communication taking place around us, uh, which leads to a lot of interactions. So these communication and the interaction uh, take place around us in the environment uh, leads to three main factors. One thing is to maintain sustainable, whether it is trees, cancer cells or bacteria, at the same time being efficient, especially when it comes to trees and being resilient when it comes to cancer cells and bacteria. For this cancer cell, it's quite unfortunate for us. Okay, so uh, if you consider the, uh, uh, the, the interaction that we find in trees, right? So what you see is that, of course, you find the trees on, uh, on the ground that we find usually, but if you go down, right? So you see that there's a lot of uh, interaction take place through these kind of channels that you find here. So this, uh, is known as mycorrhizal fungi network. So it's a fungi network that has been used to transfer nutrient in between trees. So this fungi has been connected to the roots and these channels are being used to transfer uh, nutrients. So this creates a network ecosystem between trees. So which leads to share uh, maybe uh, new, uh, different types of nutrients at the same time to impro uh, improve, uh, so uh, inform us possible threats, which we will discuss later in, in this presentation. So there's a, uh, see, uh, there's a huge ecosystem created under the ground with the support of uh, uh, these fungi networks, which shares the usual, uh, which, uh, which helps to sustain as well as to be resilient and being efficient within the, uh, uh, what you call the uh, forest environment. So if you consider this system, right? So you might find like cities that you find typically in a forest, and then you find different kind of like uh, fungi networks. So, so one network might support the nutrient X. I, I'm not a good at, I'm not a good biologist or kind of like, so, so I don't have uh, much understanding about different nutrients that they share. So maybe let's say nutrient one, nutrient two and nutrient X. And this looks like something like a multiplex network. 
at a particular period of time in my postdoc, I was wondering, can we replicate the same thing? Can't we find similar thing in the cities, right? So in cities, if you see, so we have buildings, the same time chemical industries, vehicle charging centers, maybe wind turbine plants, maybe like uh, train station, so which might use some sort of an energy, right? And then kind of interact with each other. So maybe this point might be a, a vehicle charging station, buildings uh, cluster, maybe a wind turbine plant. So we, we, are, we have different kind of energy needs, maybe electricity, gas network, heat network. So which is somewhat coincident with what you find in the trees, which is known as wood wide web, right? So I was thinking whether we can see an analogy between wood wide web, which is very uh, efficient, resilient, at the same time sustainable. But at, on the contrary, if we consider what we find in the, the superstructure in the urban areas, it is not resilient, not efficient, at the same time not sustainable. So I was wondering, can we replic uh, Can we see as? Can we use this the concept of wood wide web? to improve resilience, sustainability, and efficiency in the urban energy infrastructure. So this was the basis of urban cell. But this uh, perspective of moving from the typical uh, attribute towards what we see uh, in the energy domain towards something different like wood, web, wood wide web, move us to, uh, help, uh, uh, to change the perspective that we have about the energy infrastructure. So typically we use system models from this uh, centralized architecture or system architecture towards an ecosystem uh, in order to capture what is happening in the wide web if you want to replicate this one. So this was the main driving factor uh, within the urban cell. So which was, which was uh, uh, reversed towards this concept of urban cell. So we, we thought that we could improve sustainability, efficiency and resilience uh, by, re uh, by uh, trying to resemble wood wide web in the urban context. So, but still we have a problem. So as I said to you before, the typical uh, energy models that we have uh, does not support something like that. So this uh, made uh, us to look into what is happening in the energy literature, uh, uh, the state of the art literature in the energy domain, energy system domain. I'm not going to pour or throw a lot of uh, papers uh, and try to share it with you uh, uh, and try to exhaust uh, yourself, but I try to bring you some simple uh, overview of what is happening within the energy domain. These are some of, uh, some of the results that I obtained from the Scopus uh, search. So if you just put an uh, keyword energy and then try to come up with the number of publications. So this is a typical type of graph that you would come up with. And this is with the energy system uh, keyword. So typically if you consider energy, so you would find that there's around like 300K publications every year coming up with. So this includes modeling, experimental and everything. And uh, from the, if you, when you move from energy to energy system domain, it's like one third. So it's like somewhere around like 100K. So this is quite contrasting uh, when you compare it with uh, something uh, from a different field, such as like natural language processing, right? So one thing is that, okay, of course, I mean, the energy domain is still kind of like a very highly uh, pr productive area. So a lot of papers are coming, but at the same time, Beside this productivity, what you find is that energy system start, it's uh, ascending somewhere around like 1960s or like early 70s, right? Which is quite contrasting from something like natural language processing, which started somewhere like the early 2000 or maybe uh, late 90s, and then came up with the boom after like 2013. So which is here, you can find out with basic machine learning techniques, maybe like simple neural networks or support vector machines. And you find the, the, what you call the, this boom in after 2013, mainly driven by the deep uh, neural network. which is totally contrasting from the energy system domain because the energy system models are mainly driven by uh, basic physical models or detailed bottom-up models, so which already had um, kind of like the gradual growth, right? So which, uh, not, which did not entirely depend on uh, the, uh, deep learning or uh, machine learning techniques. So it's it's completely different, uh, two different approach approaches. So on the other hand, uh, so this significant contribution, so large number of publications coming up each year, help us to move towards uh, uh, a significant change in the superstructure of the energy system. So we start with dispatchable energy sources, combination of dispatchables. We start uh, with reduction of renewables to dispatchable and then move to storage, storage with vehicle buildings, and then we are trying to go to uh, uh, cyber physical interactions even by now. So within these models, uh, within this change in the superstructure of the energy systems, 
I try to come up with like different types of modeling techniques has been used. So simply when it comes to first generation of models, so input output models, which run the first and second uh, industrial revolution, we came up to uh, this third uh, uh, type of generation of model, the network models, which run the second industrial revolution. And now we are moving towards the distribu uh, distributed generation with the gen uh, third generation of models, which, which is uh, known as system models. So the typically energy hub concept, multi energy system concepts, all that relates with the uh, distributed generation is somewhat related with third generations of the model. But if you consider this third generation of models, what we see is that, for example, if you consider something like energy hub and still do a scope of search as I did before, what you find is that there's significant increase in the number of publications, but now again, what is happening is that we are again plateauing, right? So we are coming up with uh, uh, some sort of a saturation, right? So, so simply if you consider like the dispatch of and the energy system keyword search, again, what you find is that we are plateauing, right? So there's significant increase and then coming up with certain plateauing. So the main reason is that, uh, again, uh, when it comes to the system models also, gradually we are coming up with the saturation level. So it's not the energy system domain that has this problem, right? So there are other domains also which has similar kind of like limitations. So if you consider pharmaceutical industry, uh, which use computation models similar to us, uh, had the same problem. So we are, uh, they tried to predict the pharmaceutical properties by using uh, molecular, uh, numerical or kind of like basic physical uh, modeling techniques for molecular representations also had a similar uh, problem of plateauing. So what they did was they tried to come up with, they tried to overcome this uh, by using the deep learning or machine learning technique, which helped us to come up with this bottleneck. So when I was doing um, uh, my PhD, I thought that it might be quite interesting to move from this white box approach, which is kind of like uh, quite straightforward when it comes to energy system domain, uh, and go towards the data-driven models uh, to optimize the distributed energy system. So my uh, the main question that I was interested in uh, the design optimization, so which is a couple problem of system operation and uh, system sizing problem. So which gives us what is the optimal operation strategy in a simplified manner, as well as what is the sizing uh, energy system. So going towards data driven was not uh, simple. Uh, so we tried to uh, uh, introduce a gray box models, so uh, like something like fuzzy logic at, at initially to get an understanding how effective it could be, and then move towards the reinforcement learning and try to come up with, uh, try to address this saturation problem. So can we simplify this uh, this optimization problem? So it becomes somewhat positive. So we could uh, simplify the optimization process. The time has been reduced uh, in the optimization process. It was less bulky, which help us to kind of like extend the uh, design, uh, extend the boundaries of energy system optimization. So to look uh, at the urban energy system in a more holistic manner. So if we consider the typical design uh, uh, process, so in an urban uh, energy system, it consists of number of different steps. So which is a bulky, uh, workflow starting from determine, uh, collecting basic data, determining the distributed demand, qualitative understanding of energy potentials, quantitative understanding, clustering, and then designing of uh, systems and networks. So this is a couple of problem, and then moving to a real operation. So it's a very lengthy uh, workflow, right? So if you have very uh, bulky energy system designing model here, the thing is that it's going to be quite exhaustive, right? So what we did was we tried to simplify this particular area. So there were certain positive advantages of this one. So as simplification, so we could couple uh, the energy system optimization with more complex other models, such as building simulation, uh, urban climate models. So uh, you might know that when it comes to urban areas that uh, the wind speed has been uh, slowed down by the building clusters, which uh, tend to increase the temperature inside cities. So as a result, what will happen is the cooling demand increases. So if you typically consider an energy system, it's more demand indicator, the energy uh, demand, especially the cooling demand in urban areas due to this heat, uh, heat islanding issue, which is having an impact, critical impact on the energy system. So the simplified model that I tried to explain before, what really happened was uh, we were able to couple it with the entire workflow and then try to come up with optimal design. So what you find here is the golden color is the results that we obtained with the improved model. And then when you do not consider the urban heat tile ending. So, so, uh, so there's a significant increase when it comes to the net present value because of urban heat tile ending issue. So the simplification that uh, I talked before moving towards gray box or black box model help us to consider more detailed physics of the uh, urban areas, which was not possible before. 
Uh, it's not just urban heat islanding, so we were able to consider the impact of climate change as well. So typically, if you consider the climate change, so there are two kind of like uh, major influencing factors. So one thing is uh, what is happening during the extreme climate events, such as extreme hot or extreme, extreme cold condition, which is influencing the energy demand, as you see here. So this is typically extreme conditions. At the same time, what really happens is your renewable energy potential can be kind of like disturbed by these extreme conditions as well. The same event that we observed sometime uh, recent uh, last year, this time uh, in Texas, so which collapsed the entire energy infrastructure. So the simplification I, I explained you before help us to consider both these aspects in the energy system domain, energy system optimization process. So we were able to introduce stochastic robust optimization. So the, simpli the simplification, we could consider long time uh, horizons because typically climate models uh, requires a long term understanding of what is happening in the uh, uh, simulation uh, framework, for example, like at least 30 years, and then not just a single a single uh, uh, climate model, you might require several climate models as well. So it's a bulky data set that you need to consider in the simulation phase. So we introduced stochastic robust optimization techniques to understand both extreme as well as typical variation in the climate, and then try to come up with the optimal system design. So what you understand is that when you're moving from typically a simple energy system optimization to urban uh, energy system design process, so the process become a little bit more complicated. And then when you try to consider the climate change, it's become a little bit more bulky. So then if you try to consider the compound impact of uh, climate variation as well as urban densification together, the workflow become extremely exhaustive. So you need to consider multiple spatial resolution, maybe at global uh, scale, urban scale, as well as urban microclimate scale, especially going at the building scale. At the same time, at different uh, uh, spatial resolution. So, so typically you need to consider regional as well as urban, as well as urban microclimate. So you need to consider, to capture both these different types of climate models, you need to consider different spatial resolutions as well as different, different temporal resolutions. So I'll give you a simple example. If you consider like extreme events, so it might be prevailing for like uh, one week, but if you need to consider long-term impact of uh, seasonal variation, right? So you need to consider somewhere around like 30 years. So it's like one week to 30 years. So it's a long uh, different in the uh, scale of uh, uh, temporal resolution. Same thing come up with the spatial resolution. So if you need to consider what is happening at the building scale, you need something like urban microclimate. But if you consider like direct global climate model, so it's work at the uh, regional scale. So you, you have to consider different spatial resolution. So, so considering both the time as well as space uh, together, a different scale, we need to come up with the multi-spatial multi -spatial temporal resolution models. So such a complex model with the energy system optimization requiring different kind of components such as stochastic, deterministic, robustic. So the optimization models become extremely bulky. So in simple terms, what really happened is even with the uh, changes that we introduced uh, to the system models, with the uh, gray box or data driven models, the, <laughs> the models become more and more bulky when it comes to uh, see what is happening actually at the urban scale, right? So if we go back to the original problem that we started, converting it to an ecosystem becomes almost impossible. So that is where we try to see, can we use uh, something new, something other than what we're used with uh, to see uh, an urban ecosystem, right? So something that usually comes up with the, uh, uh, what you call industrial ecology side or kind of like urban planning perspective is urban, metab urban metabolism. And then energy hub is the concept that we're used to us and something similar is like smart grid, a little bit more about considering cyber physical interaction. So what I explained you before with the trees, uh, uh, the wood white web is that uh, uh, the resemblance of a city to wood white web requires three main requirements. So one is the interaction between trees or the spatial interaction, those what you call a spatial coupling. If you consider one tree, it might be interacting with the other trees with not just one nutrient, right? So there'll be more than one nutrient. So it's like you have several sectors. So it's like you need to consider the sector coupling. And typically if you consider a design problem, which I'm kind of like uh, more interested or maybe an operation for control problem, you might need a bottom-up approach, right? So detailed physics. So three main factors are required. So sector coupling, spatial coupling, at the same time, bottom-up approach. So if you consider this urban metabolism, so it is considering both sector and spatial coupling, but it's very difficult to couple with the system dynamic models that we use in the energy domain. And when it comes to energy hub, so smart grid problem with, with the coupling between either sector coupling or spatial coupling. 
At the same time, as I mentioned before, we are coming up with a major challenge because the models itself right now for Energy Hub itself is becoming more and more bulky. It's extremely challenging to handle such models because either it will take huge amount of time in the design process or it might easily collapse because of the complexity. So this is where we try to decide to move from the typical architecture, the system models to a system of system models. So typically the energy system models that we have is like energy hub or multi energy system with system models. I, I try to introduce that the data driven system models as 3.1, but it's more or less something like three. But we try to move from the system architecture towards system of system architecture, or more, of, more or less decentralized architecture. So that is something uh, new that we try to come up with this urban cell paper. So what we did in urban cell is that we consider an urban area to be, uh, we, we, uh, we clustered an urban area to uh, separate uh, localities, which we introduced as a cell. Within cell, we consider different sectors or within the, this locality, we consider uh, different sectors, energy, building, transportation as different sectors. And we consider the interaction between these as sector coupling. And in addition to the uh, interactions that you find within the locality, uh, uh, in addition to the sector coupling in simple terms, we consider the interaction between the cells, so which we call as the spatial coupling. So altogether, we consider uh, urban scale, system dynamics, bottom-up model detail, sector, and spatial coupling. Uh, and we try to do the design and operation optimization, or like system uh, design optimization. So it's a couple problem of design and operation. So this was not uh, simple. So this uh, this process uh, was, came out as number of uh, or collection of papers. So we are moving from centralized architecture towards decentralized architecture. So we first start up with uh, try to coming up with n minus one security uh, grid optimization with system of architecture. So we used uh, a decentralized optimization algorithm, which is based on heuristic methods to optimize systems, and then the transmission network in between these systems, considering entirely the electrical sector. Uh, considering n minus one with uh, uh, milk with bender cut uh, to guarantee n minus one both system as well as transmission optimization. So this is decentralized and decentralized uh, optimization to different levels. And then uh, last year we came up with another paper using game theoretic approach. So decentralized optimization system as well as uh, game theoretic approach uh, towards the optimization the network as well as system. So somewhat completely decentralized architecture. And that is where uh, that was where we started to uh, kind of like get the, uh, the fundamentals uh, of the mat mathematical models that we use for the uh, paper that has been published in the uh, with the urban cell concept. So what we do in this urban cell is quite straightforward. So of, of course, you are going to you can go through the paper. So I'm I'm not going to explain uh, the, the details uh, of the paper. So I, I try to encourage you to go through the paper. So I just give you a very simple overview of the work that we did. So what we do is that simply we cluster and then come up with different urban morphologies for each locations and then try to, uh, based on the urban morphology, we consider what is the electricity demand for, uh, as well as electricity heating and cooling demand for the building cluster, as well as transportation. And then we try to optimize the energy hub as well as the urban morphology together. So what the architecture of the building, what is the optimal architecture of the building uh, for that particular neighborhood uh, or district. Uh, and then what is the optimal <clears throat> network? So we just only consider the electricity network in this specific case, but could be easily uh, extended to heating uh, as well as gas network as well. And this uh, uh, goes through a kind of like game theoretic approach and then find come up with the optimal design for each cluster. At the same time, the interaction between the uh, clusters or the network. So we are able to show that uh, the urban cell concept can reduce uh, the cost by 37% because we combine, uh, combinedly op optimize uh, system uh, design as well as the uh, uh, cost for the uh, network at the same time improve the renewable energy integration by 25%. So the two major questions that is related with uh, uh, sustainability as well as uh, uh, efficiency can be kind of like addressed uh, using this urban cell concept. So what is next? Uh, so urban cell um, is not just kind of like uh, uh, cannot can be used for this uh, uh, optimization of energy system. So we were thinking of trying to extend the concept further. So which might be interesting to you to see what what uh, can be kind of like address the third uh, main requirement that I explained to you before. So which is about the resilience. So typically. Uh, 
uh, what we uh, what we know and what we observed even in the famous Texas failure is that of course you can improve resilience at a certain level uh, the efficiency or some some something uh, directly related to the techno-economical aspect the efficiency as well but are we improving these with uh, sacrifice in the resilience so that is a direct question so what we're interesting right now is to kind of like uh, use this uh, concept to improve the resilience and see in a holistic manner can an ecosystem energy ecosystem could withstand uh, extreme events or threat of uh, kind of like an extreme events while improving the sustainability as well as uh, efficiency so again i go back to the basic concept of uh, wood white bib so where you have uh, uh, trees uh, so typically whenever there's a pest attack for trees what will really happen is um, it creates a certain amount of chemicals. And what they do is that they use this wood by paper to transfer these chemicals to the other trees and inform the other trees that there is such attack. So before this attack comes uh, to the other, other trees, right? So they are aware that there could be a pest attack. And then what they do is that they create a certain chemical uh, within these uh, trees, which might resist the pest. So they are aware that such attack would come and then try to kind of like uh, get uh, improve the resistance. So this is an area that we are interested in right now to extend the urban shelf concept uh, to see whether the resilience of uh, uh, urban energy ecosystem could be improved by resembling what is happening in the wood white web uh, to improve the uh, resilience as well. So there is a future work that we are currently working uh, right now, and uh, this. Uh, uh, so within this context, so what we try to see what is uh, the impact or try to quantify the impact uh, on different sectors at the urban scale, uh, uh, locally at the cell level, so quantify the impact and then try to quantify the impact of interaction between different cells. So how this kind of an uh, uh, event could impact the interaction uh, and then the holistically the overall impact. So for example, if we consider an extreme climate event, so it might in, uh, uh, come up with uh, Sorry, if you consider extreme climate events such as a heat wave, so it might increase uh, the energy demand of localities, right? So, which could be uh, addressed with the support of uh, neighboring kind of like energy uh, uh, urban cells. So, something can uh, generate more and then help to kind of like address this kind of like limitation. If you consider kind of like events such as wildfires so or the interaction between this urban cell can be disrupted. So, which means that the urban cell itself need to self-generate uh, and then try to operate in such instances. So, you need to be uh, kind of like auto more autonomous in such cases. So, how to maintain such interaction between different sectors to be more autonomous is something quite interesting to see. So, this is an area that we are working right now uh, to use um, the basic concept of uh, wood by web to see how we can improve the resilience of uh, uh, urban areas by using the urban cell. So this brings me to the end of uh, this presentation and uh, uh, you are you're welcome to ask uh, any questions uh, and I'm, I'm happy to hear your feedback about uh, uh, the, uh, the urban cell concept. And I hope you would try to uh, talk to a tree soon. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. So uh, to start with, please uh, just uh, let's say, uh, uh, to give the time to all the, all the audience. Uh, here we have uh, one question uh, that is posed in the dialogue box. It says that, uh, thanks for such a wonderful talk, very inspiring. May I ask how do you map the topography of a city and took the sheds of buildings into account in your energy generation model, like influence on solar PV generation? Okay, uh, the, that is quite an interesting question. Uh, Thanks a lot for that question. So typically uh, here we have this uh, basic uh, uh, flow chart. Uh, so we are starting with the collecting of basic data, then distributed demand, as well as qualitative understanding of uh, the work and then the quantitative. So the question might be right at here, right? So typically uh, there are two ways of doing it. Uh, so uh, first I must say that I'm an energy system optimization guy. I'm not a, I, I'm not a specialist in uh, building simulation. So uh, I was working previously with our group, so, uh, so which uh, had the expertise uh, uh, of uh, doing this work. I could give a very, uh, uh, what do you call, a, uh, 
overview answer for this one, but I don't know the details because I was not the person who did this, uh, did that work. So there were two approaches. So one approach was to use machine learning. So they were using, I think, uh, random forest technique to get an understanding about, uh, a quantitative understanding about the uh, PV generation at the roof level. So they were uh, they had some measured value at a particular area of Geneva, and then try to map it with the uh, uh, other location for uh, for the case studies that we did in Sweden. So this was uh, one uh, thing uh, that we did, uh, and the other one was uh, it was from in the other cases it was from the uh, building simulation modules uh, uh, that they tried to come up with the, the uh, shading and everything. Uh, when we have, when we do not have both these, right? So when we do not have both these, what we do is that we take the total uh, uh, solid radiation with the optimal uh, tilt angle and take a fraction out of it, something like eighty percent. So there is the approach that we use when we do not have both these uh, three uh, solutions. So we have a very detailed physics answer, which is based on detailed building simulation that considers the shading. And then a simplified machine learning algorithm, if you want to do something like random for us, where you take uh, actual values and then try to extrapolate it. And this, uh, the third one, simple one, uh, is that you take uh, you take the total uh, horizontal one uh, with the optimal tilt angle and take a fraction out of it. So this might be the third, uh, third option. So I have worked with all three <laughs> options, actually. Okay, good, right. thank you. Okay, so, okay. Uh, here we have another question. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. How did you model the current or existed urban infrastructure, maybe as a constraint in the integrated system? Uh, what do you mean by, uh, is it the energy demand aspect uh, or is it like for the building simulation, it's like the 3D modeling of the building. So, so there are two questions, I mean, two ways uh, that, uh, how did you model the current infrastructure? Uh, hello, Professor. Maybe I can clarify yeah. my uh, sure. question. Uh, yes, uh, I, I want to know uh, when you want to view like the integrated uh, system, uh, is it the ideal conceptual model or you also consider the current infrastructure into modeling this because it's kind of a constraint? Yes. Thanks, uh, thanks Lee, thanks for the clarification. Uh, interesting question. Uh, so we work with, uh, actually, I mean, what I try to give you as a brief overview of a uh, lot of papers that we did. Uh, so in certain papers, what we did was uh, we, directly to what is existing. For example, like the case that I explained with the urban climate for the Palestine. So we are, as you said before, you do not have uh, uh, an opportunity for any change at the present context, but you have a scenario for 2050. For, for example, the results that I shared with you, maybe this one. So these are with the expansion, urban expansion for 2050, where you have more densification towards 2050. But uh, for the paper that I have explained here, uh, so with this one, yeah, it's a very lengthy workflow. So what we did was, it's very difficult to consider the entire cities because it's very bulky, right? So then what we do is that did was we used uh, something called urban archetypes, right? So instead of taking the entire city, so we take this sky view effect and all this stuff and then create small archetypes. And then based on these archetypes, we did the, the simulation. So we can go with uh, either approach. For the urban cell paper, uh, I think, uh, I was not uh, the one work with these uh, uh, urban morphologies. Uh, Kavan was working on it. So Kavan was uh, using uh, uh, the actual data as far as possible for Stockholm. But I, I'm not very sure about it, uh, whether it is, uh, whether he has used uh, some hypothetical scenarios. So you can use both scenarios. So for example, if you're going to use actual exact data, so you can come up with certain changes considering future expansion or you can come up with hypothetical, as you said before. Okay, I understand, thank you. Oh, we have one more question. Yes. Or, sorry, thanks for interesting talk. The idea of multi-layer urban cells seems to be very similar with GIS. Did you borrow some idea from GIS? In addition, besides the 
uh, hexagon, how do you consider using other special units? Many thanks. Okay. Thanks, sir. So actually, this is a question from uh, one of our reviewers as well. So we did not uh, actually. Uh, well, first thing is that my my understanding of GIS is very poor. So uh, uh, so I was not having uh, much understanding. And when we got it from the reviewers, uh, I had a quick look, but I did not found it. But I'm sure it might be some some something related to GIS as well. So I need to study uh, a bit. But as I as I mentioned you earlier. So we try to move towards what is happening in, in nature and try to uh, kind of like ex, uh, kind of like replicate what is happening in nature because as far as I be, I mean I strongly believe that nature is kind of like best inventor but for sure there might be other areas that you have in JS so in addition to JS uh, uh, it's not directly but I mean even in cellular automata you have these kind of like cells interacting with each other. So the second part is, in addition to beside hexagon, do you consider using other spatial units? Uh, yes, actually in the paper, you might find that we consider square as well as hexagon. So like three different configurations. Uh, so this, uh, we considered in addition, uh, scenarios in addition to hexagon. But I would like to uh, mention one thing here. So, uh, so typically, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, so the main barrier here is uh, the uh, we, we use a kind of like game theoretic approach, right, uh, towards the optimization. So game theoretic optimization is a bulky optimization. Uh, so when you have uh, when you increase, so in this case we move up to like nine uh, actors. So for example, if you have like hundred actors, right, so hundred uh, different localities, right. So it's quite challenging because uh, we, we did uh, we did uh, both cooperative as well as non-cooperative scenarios. So uh, the convergence become quite challenging. So maybe we, we might need to see some sort of diffusion technique to increase the number of cells because for certain areas, for certain cities, uh, you I mean, just nine or 12 cells is not enough, right? So you need to consider a large number of cells. So one, one, one approach might be like you use diffusion or other techniques so that the convergence would be fast. Or maybe you could do something like hierarchical structure, right? So, so you have like large number of cells within a certain cluster and then you optimize it. And then on top of that, you do another optimization selection of optimal cluster together. So this might be kind of like approaches whenever you try to kind of like increase uh, the number of cells. Thanks a lot, it's an inter interesting question. Thank you. So any other questions? So, uh, I, okay, thank you. So, I, I uh, please, uh, I think uh, you give us a very like uh, interesting introduction by considering the ge uh, geological system. Uh, so, like, so I think because now uh, in one slide you also mentioned that we have blooming over. Uh, the publication in uh, in energy and also let's say in machine learning or deep learning so uh, so it's like we convert or transit from the physical model or gray uh, blocks model to black box model this is but if in this case actually it's hard for us to understand what's going on uh, inside i mean in that black box so but at the same time as also you just mentioned we want to know uh, let's say the, the plants are attacking the trees. So we want to know how the roots that send the chemicals to their friends are the trees. So what's the communication between these roots? So it's, it's hard for us to, to, to reveal this uh, phenomenon or make it clear. So how do you think about these uh, conflicts between the new yeah. technology, let's say uh, deep learning, but at the same time, we want to explain and know the mechanism behind it to to really build the resilience of the urban system. Uh, thanks a lot. It's quite an interesting question. So uh, uh, I try to give a very quick overview about uh, what is happening uh, actually in the energy uh, optimization process. So maybe I'll give you a quick overview. Uh, okay, about this uh, optimization. So what we did was uh, we introduced the fuzzy logic to replace uh, the dispatch strategy here, uh, which is somewhat simplifying the dispatch strategy instead of using the MILP uh, approach in integer linear programming. Uh, so in the optimization, and then what we did was we went towards the reinforcement learning here. So, uh, and then did the optimization of uh, both uh, 
the optimal dispatch strategy as well as system sizing. So this is the brief overview of uh, what is happening uh, in the, uh, with the introduction of these models. And then coming back to your original question of how these uh, uh, interactions uh, could be captured by machine learning techniques. Again, it's an interesting question. So uh, how we see these trees is as different agents, right? So typically, uh, if you consider these different agents, uh, trees to be different agents. So there are mechanisms how we can capture uh, these different agents or multi-agent problem in the energy system optimization. So we have not come up with a specific way of how, uh, how, how we could kind of like come up with uh, the address this question. So what we try to do, do is that we try to use this concept of what is happening in the wood by web and um, come up with a multi-agent uh, model uh, to replicate uh, what is happening in the wood by web. So still we are looking uh, towards to coming up with the kind of like way to replicate this one. So for example, if we come up, if you consider the scenario of uh, the, uh, the losing of spatial coupling. So this scenario we have considered, so it's simple as you are you supposed to work as a totally a fully autonomous scenario, like standalone system. So this scenario you can consider. Uh, so, so which means that the tree uh, is stop interacting with the, all the other trees and then try to operate on its own. Like, so then the operation strategy can easily adapt. But the scenario that, I, that you have uh, asked from me that one uh, system sends a signal to the other sy system, you need to change the operation because uh, there's something bad happening. Uh, so this depends on quantifying the impact, right? So the, the type of message uh, that you create and sending it and then understanding it, and then you have your own operation strategy. So one thing that we, we believe is that uh, either MR, uh, multi-agent RL, uh, reinforcement learning, or something like robust multi-agent reinforcement learning, because these are extreme events, right? So not happening typical conditions could be helpful. So we are working on... Uh, both multi-agent RL as well as uh, 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 multi robust multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, towards implementation of uh, these uh, uh, these issues. But I must say, uh, I mean, it's not entirely data-driven models can be used. So you might see, you could, you could also consider uh, some other physical models as well. The only thing is that you need to come up with a methodology to quantify what would be the impact and then to transfer it so that the other neighbors could understand. Uh, I'm sorry, I could not give a fully uh, complete transfer because this is, this is something that we try to address at the moment. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks uh, for uh, answering. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Any, oh, we have uh, uh, oh, we have one more question. Uh, as for the www, is it just an interesting metaphor, or is there any real, real inspiration for mechanism improvement? Yes. So, so what I explained here is the system. Actually, I mean, I stopped at here. So, which is based on system of system models, right? So, www is the World Wide Web. So, it's it's a network of network architecture. So, it's a very complex one. So we are in the process of thinking of uh, network of network architecture. Uh, but I'm sorry, I could not explain it uh, in detail. I think I might have a slide uh, on the system of, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so if you consider the, uh, yeah, something like this. So uh, we, tr we, we were thinking of uh, this one. So, so for example, so typically we have this, uh, physical layers like this. And then if you consider uh, something like network and application, so which is like sensing as well as uh, the intelligence. Uh, so in order to improve the flexibility, so we, are, we can come up with, uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we are combining these physical layers with the support of virtual layers. Uh, you can come up with uh, cyber physical interaction. So then we are, you could move from system of system architecture to a cyber enabled network of network architecture and we are, which is something like www. But I, 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 I will, I will uh, stop here instead of explaining uh, details of this one because it's not the main focus of this one, but I must say it's possible. Uh, any other questions? 
so uh, uh, if no questions, please allow me have one last question. So <laughs> it's already very late in the United States. Uh, in, in okay. okay, so uh, uh, in your presented uh, this uh, urban sales, what do we consider that? Because we consider different uh, sectors like uh, uh, industry, buildings, uh, transportation. Uh, uh, for each sector, maybe, I'm not quite sure, maybe uh, for each sector, we may have an optimized size for, let's say, regular hexagon or uh, uh, grid cells. So, mm -hmm. but for different sectors, we may have different uh, uh, optimized size or shapes, but we want to, uh, integrate them together as a uniform, uh, let's say, urban cell. So in this case, how do you do this? Uh, uh, let's say, define the, 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 the resolution or, or shape or et cetera. The, also, in one slide, you also uh, should ask that the urban system, all of the urban, let's say, divided in, uh, into several uh, blocks. So how do you uh, determine uh, these uh, blocks, which let's say, which area should belong to one block. So because in my opinion, this is closely related with the electric, uh, uh, let's say renewable energy supply and demand, it will be various significantly. So that will definitely uh, influence the uh, urban system. I mean, the performance. So so how do you define this? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, it's quite, uh, your first question is very challenging one. So typically, uh, as you said before, so what we do is that we, we use the clustering. So it's, it's ideally should not be a hexagon or something like this. So the shape could be different. Actually, I, I explain it hexagon because it's quite easy. So you might find here also, it's not like exactly hexagon, right? So the shapes are quite school. Yeah. Uh, school so it, it's not, not like this. But then you have an in, quite an interesting question, which is that this clustering depends on the size, uh, the system configuration as and network. There's a coupling between this one, right? So typically, I mean, in our work, we do not consider this coupling, but there are research work that has considered this coupling. So the clustering process can be done by considering system deciding as well as network optimization problem, which becomes uh, a couple problem. So an iterative architecture until you converge uh, has been taken place, but we have not done it. So if you consider, if you go through the literature, there are papers uh, on it actually, how this clustering could be done while optimizing system design as well as network uh, uh, thing. So it's, a, it's an iterative process. So the decoupling, this, this is existing in the literature, although we did not do it. But okay. the first question is really challenging, I would say. So the, typically the, the question is that, uh, so just imagine that you consider several sectors. Uh, yeah. uh, the thing is, uh, so for example, if you consider the urban morphology and so within the certain urban morphology, you could have several combinations of uh, industrial as well as uh, uh, residential or kind of like uh, other different sectors. So where your industry demand or the their demand could be significantly changes as well as for not just electricity, but for hydrogen and heat and everything could be changes. This, this is actually, uh, uh, <laughs> this is a really a challenging question. Actually, we have uh, one example, we try to address uh, this question, uh, but the main thing is that, uh, um, uh, so for the moment, what we do is that uh, for each cluster, when you take a certain cluster, what we try to do is that we try to get optimized clusters. So instead of uh, having uh, within the cluster, but uh, so uh, let me give uh, uh, an example. So, so just imagine that when you have, uh, when you take the urban morphology, you could optimize uh, within the uh, uh, urban morphology, you could optimize uh, the industrial sector. Uh, building sector as well as uh, the um, uh, the other sectors, right? So in this paper, we did not consider that optimization. So okay. what we did was we limited the urban morphologies prior optimizing the uh, cluster. Okay. So we did not uh, do that sort of an optimization. So if you want to do such an optimization, it is possible, but then it should be hierarchical. But then okay. hierarchical multi-agent system optimization is like, it's, it's really difficult. So, okay. so because, because I mean, uh, the optimization problem that we worked out uh, is a game theoretic one. So it take like two days. So without considering this hierarchy, but, uh, but you can address this problem as a hierarchical problem. So which, is, which means that within the cluster, what you do is that you optimize the, uh, uh, the optimal combination for industry buildings and transportation and things like that. 
So for the case, we did not do it. So we 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 try we we took some uh, urban morphologies directly, presuming that they are the optimal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering the question. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from audience? Okay. If not, uh, let's. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much for for your time and for your great talk. And this is really inspiration, especially for let's say transfer from the ecosystem to the urban system. Okay. Thank you. And looking forward to getting uh, to to hearing from you again, and we can communicate later on. Okay. So thanks. We'll thanks a lot. Some uh, uh, study that is also focusing on the urban system. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's thank a you very much. Thanks. Okay, okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.